All right, thank you all. Our uh, next presentation, we have Professor Elizabeth Wilson, where she is a professor in the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. Uh, she teaches human rights law and public international law there. She graduated from Harvard Law School in 2003 and then worked as an associate at two Washington, D.C. firms. During her time there, she did some work on behalf of Guantanamo detainees and was a participant in the early stages of the Boumediene versus Bush uh, case that was eventually cited in favor of the detainees by the Supreme Court in 2008. Uh, she also coordinated and drafted the report by the Center for Constitutional Rights on Torture and Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading Treatment at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and was involved in lobbying efforts to defeat the habeas stripping provisions of the Detainee Treatment Act. Uh, and her paper today is The Sovereign Immunity Underpinnings of Foreign Official Immunity. Our discussant today is Professor Larry Helfer here at the Duke University School of Law. He's an expert in the areas of international law and institutions, international adjudication and dispute settlement, human rights, including LGBT rights, and international intellectual property and law and policy. He's a co-director of the Duke Law Center for Comparative and International Law, and a senior, excuse me, the Center for International and Comparative Law. I got it mixed up with our journal's order of uh, comparative and international. And he is a senior fellow with Duke's Keenan Institute for Ethics. At the law school here, he teaches international law, international civil litigation, international human rights law, and uh, reconciling intellectual property and human rights. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Wilson. Let's give him all a round of applause. Thank you, Dominic, and thank you to the Duke Journal of Comparative and International Law for the opportunity to be here today at this uh, really fascinating symposium. And also, uh, I want to thank the journal for their latitude um, with the topic um, for this, for my presentation here. Um, due to my writing schedule, I wouldn't have been able to uh, write a paper, a new paper on foreign sovereign immunity, um, foreign official immunity, but uh, I am working on something related to the sovereign immunity underpinnings to official um, immunity. So I want to talk a little bit about that today, and I'm, I'm thinking that this may be a uh, both from the timing and the subject matter, a bit of a, a kind of a musical interlude um, in all, with all the law, hard law crunching um, papers that you are listening to. Uh, this is uh, more of an exploration and a kind of um, work in progress or a, a stage where I'm thinking, trying to think through some big ideas and I'm not committed to any of the conclusions that I'm presenting here, but I'm just trying to raise some questions and, and think about um, uh, ways to move forward. Um, this is an extension of work that I've been doing in my scholarship um, and in policy work for the Atlantic Council and the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict on what kinds of international human rights law may apply to nonviolent civil resistance movements and to the aid that is being offered to them um, from uh, foreign sources. Um, and here I'm looking at what are the implications, if any, of nonviolent civil resistance movements for the way that we conceive sovereignty and sovereign immunity. Um, until sovereign immunity, as it's been um, mentioned several times today, is the underpinnings of official immunity, even though these two, these doctrines, these several doctrines, are beginning to diverge in different ways. Um, nevertheless, it seems to me that until we definitively um, dislodge or reformulate the underlying concept of sovereign immunity, it may con continue to seem that holding officials accountable for their human rights violations abrogates some privilege that they are entitled to by right and, and rattles the cosmic international legal order. But reformulating the doctrine of sovereign immunity is a prohibitively daunting task. Um, it's alive and well in 2015 after the ICJ's 2012 decision in jurisdictional immunities of the state, a case where the IC ICJ appeared to resolve in the negative once and for all the question of whether gross human rights violations waive or otherwise abrogate the sovereign immunity of the state. As Christian Toms has 
recently remarked in the blog EJL Talk, few questions have prompted as much intense debate in the literature as the question of what rules immunity apply in respect of grave violations of international law. And he adds, since the number of plausible arguments and approaches is finite, use Kogan's implied waiver, there's a lot of duplication and repetition in the debate. So one must be very humble in thinking there is anything new to say. Um, so what I want to do here is, um, is pose a, a specific question, and that is related to the notion of popular sovereignty as it relates to sovereignty in the international legal context, and ask, and I may decide that the answer is no, um, whether the emergence of the widespread use of nonviolent civil resistance tactics on the part of civilian groups in the context of democracy or independent struggle should change our view of whether popular sovereignty has a place in international law. So I begin um, by talking about what I call the king's two bodies of law, internal and external sovereignty. The king's two bodies refers to a medieval notion um, that is one of the origins of sovereign sovereignty and sovereign immunity, and that was the, the notion that the king had two bodies, a human body that was a prey to human infirmities, and a body politic that cannot be um, uh, seen or handled, um, consisting of policy and government, and constituted for the direction of the people and the management of the public wheel. Um, there are lots of uh, different ideas about sovereignty. I was intrigued to find out that the ILC is even jettisoning, jettisoning this term because it's so uh, confusing and, uh, as Michael Ignatieff says, uh, the most uh, mysterious term in our political vocabulary. But I think to oversimplify, but not greatly, we can break it down into two uh, different types, at least analytically for the purpose here. Um, one is uh, international legal sovereignty, which we can say is like the Hobbesian Leviathan. Uh, the people give up their power to the state, but cannot take it back. And once the state, once created, the state has its own existence above and apart from the people. Uh, domestic sovereignty is often, not always, Lockean, where there is a social contract between the people and the state. Uh, generally speaking, it is taken for granted that popular sovereignty, or the Lockean sovereignty, or social contract notions of sovereignty, are relevant only to domestic sovereignty, and not to the status of the state in an international legal system. The unaccountable, the immune sovereign in international law does not derive his or her authority from the people, but from the need to maintain international order. And yet, this king that can do no wrong troubles the moral conscience and the idea that international peace could be purchased with the blood of the sovereign citizens has been demonstrated time and again to be incorrect. Um, in recent years, there has been a high profile attempt to reconceptualize sovereignty in international law or, or to, and to bridge this gap between internal and external sovereignty. Um, and that experiment is, uh, I'm referring to is the responsibility to protect. As is well known in his two famous addresses to the UN General Assembly in the late 1990s, Kofi Annan identified the tension between these two bodies of law and called on the international community to find a solution to what to do when confronted with the situation of another Rwanda. Um, he discussed the dilemma in the conceptual language of these two notions of sovereignty, one vesting in the state and the second in people and in individuals. Um, as is also well known, the authors of the ICISS report, the International Commission on Intervention in State Sovereignty, who took up his challenge, um, reformulated that to, as, in, in, as a central piece of redefining, of outlining the criteria for humanitarian intervention. So the resulting eponymous concept responsibility to protect has become identified with humanitarian intervention, but it really conceptually designates the reformulation of sovereignty underpinning the new, this new doctrine. So the re responsibility to protect, oops. Um, 
tries to bring the international conception of sovereignty more in line with the domestic one by creating what I will call paternalistic sovereignty, which stresses the state's duties towards its subjects and essentially requires of the Leviathan that he or she be nice and take care of their citizens. Um, scholars, in addition, have conceptually um, elaborated this shift. Um, I'll just mention a couple um, articles um, by Ann Peters, um, uh, Humanity as the Alpha and Omega of Sovereignty, where she tries to de derive the normative status of sovereignty from humanity and, the, and the, the legal principle that human rights, interests, needs, and security must be respected and promoted, and that this humanistic principle is also the telos of the international human legal system. And then also Evan J. Criddle and Evan Fox Descent, uh, the fiduciary concept of Deuce Kogan's lays bare the protectionism in this, the paternalism in this doctrine by taking as its theoretical starting point a much neglected passage from the doctrine of right where Kant discusses the innate right of humanity which all children may assert against their parents as citizens of the world. And they then go on to say that although they can reconcile their idea of the fiduciary state with uh, the social contract theory, they really don't need social contract to do that. And it's clear that they don't want to bring the social contract into it. Um, so this conceptualization of sovereignty as R2P must be adjudged thus far to have been a failure as it resulted in a weak response in Darfur, over response and weak follow through in Libya, and no response in Syria with catastrophic results. Not committing myself to how much of a causal factor this was, it, uh, it's clear that the paternalistic reformulation of sovereignty in R2P did not reconceive sovereignty as residing in the people and so fell short of recognizing the role, the often considerable role of human agency in state formation and state maintenance. Um, but is it any possible? Is it possible to go any further uh, that, hmm, sorry, than R2P in recognizing such agency in international law? So now I turn to the theoretical objections to injecting popular sovereignty into the international legal system, and I'm mostly here relying, um, in, in engaging in an article by Brad R. Roth uh, called "Secessions, Coups, and the International Rule of Law: Assessing the Decline of the Effective Control Doctrine," which thoroughly sets out the main arguments against why this would be a good uh, idea, and what he what he says is that the international legal doctrine doctrine um, has this common thread in this both the state the recognition of states and the recognitions of governments of the doctrine of the requiring effective control through internal processes that is you don't recognize in international law either a state or a government until the internal processes have churned through whatever conflicts they're they're uh, they're needing to do and they one or another group asserts effective control so this is a kind of an ugly doctrine, morally and legally, um, because it may be, as he said, reliant on the very violence and coercion that the international order disdains to dignify in interstate relations. So you have an international order which is say, saying, you know, warfare between states is verboten, and yet within states, this you know, violent conflict or, uh, or struggle is just the de facto way you have to go about uh, generating a state. Now, is there a good alternative? He says that you know, popular will is complex and normatively loaded, and if you try to impose it from outside, it's, it's gonna fail, and it's gonna, worse, it's gonna be like a usurpation. Um, it's, the effective control is really more formidable than we think because there isn't uh, a good alternative. Um, you know, we have to figure out who the populace is acquiescing to under what, whatever circumstances it, it, it decides to acquiesce and then recognize that entity. Um, and in his, uh, he, he uses the phrase, um, which I, I didn't quite quote, but the international order's attribution of sovereign independence has traditionally entailed the right of each to fight its civil war in peace and to be ruled by its own thugs. 
And then he says, well, is, this any, is, is that worse than the right to be ruled by domestic thugs on the one hand or by foreigners on the other announcing benevolent uh, intentions? I'm getting a little behind on my slides here and turning it off once again. Um, his argument works better with respect to states because the international legal system distinguishes sharply between states and governments. Um, but he also applies it to government recognition. And then he kind of turns around on himself and says, well, there's actually uh, popular sovereignty is what the UN Charter recognizes in its doctrine of non-intervention, that, that popular sovereignty is actually claimed by you know, the, the ugliest military dictatorship and the ugliest one-party state, and that this is what, um, you know, we already kind of have this. Of course, he's taking a very broad uh, Monto Video convention uh, I, approach to popular sovereignty or the, the acquiescence of the people to the government and not the more stringent form in the, the Lockean kind of social contract. Um, and um, he says that with respect to those kind of bad regimes, in that context, the effective control doctrine could be seen not as a repudiation of the popular sovereignty norm, but rather as an application of it in those circumstances of ideological pluralism. So turning to now to nonviolent civil resistance, um, you know, does it make a difference how you get to this effective control? And his presumption is this, the struggle, the ordeal that, that goes on um, in, the, in the state formation st stage, it's necessarily a violent one. Um, so first, what is nonviolent civil resistance? And I'm taking this definition from Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth's prize-winning book, Why Civil Resistance works and what they really crushed, crunched numbers to show that civil resistance uh, movements are very um, effective uh, politically. Uh, so it's a civilian-based method to wage conflict through social, psychological, economic, and political means without the threat or use of violence, including acts of commission and omission, symbolic protests, economic boycotts, labor strikes, political and social non-cooperation, and many, many more. Um, it's used to put across public demands, to mobilize the public to oppose or different, support different policies. It has played major roles in independent state formation and pro-democracy movements, uh, such as the formation of the state of Hungary and Poland, the pro-democracy movements that helped to bring about the end of the Soviet Union, the Gandhi-led national movement to bring about India, India's dependence of, from Britain, and the formation of its assorted people into a unified state. Now, these nonviolent social movements are multiplying at a rapid pace. Um, they've been seen in, they, they, there's waves going on, but this new wave, this latest wave, appears to some observers to be very different in nature. Um, and it's um, uh, 60 countries since 2010, every region of the world, and, and the key here, that some see a fundamental shift in the relationship between citizens as the state, as citizens' participatory function, it becomes more continuous oversight of state action. And what I, what I say is that um, although the social contract is often regarded as a legal fiction, representing a hypothesized emotion, motion in time, moment in time that never really existed. The nonviolent civil resistance movements can make this contract real. And because in the ordinary operation of both states and governments, there is an ongoing social contract that we may characterize as latent or dormant. And the, this is manifested in the actions or inactions on the part of citizens that create the cooperation necessary for the everyday administrative functioning of the apparatuses of power. As Gandhi observed long ago, even the most powerful cannot rule without the cooperation of the ruled. Um, civil resistance or people power is the ability of citizens or other uh, non-state actors to organize in order to intentionally withdraw consent from the government and thus compel the government to comply with their demands. And, and through this withdrawal of consent, this assertion of, of popular sovereignty is actually 
has repercussions and changes the shape of the international geopolitical order and therefore sort of meets the criteria of you know, getting into international law because it is having international effects. And so I'm going to just end with some conclusions, questions, tentative predictions. Um, first about accountability. Um, accountability is coming from the ground up. The, the, the accountability uh, actions that, that we have seen um, have started with movements, citizens' movements, to pressure mostly national governments to bring officials or former officials to account. And this, this action has some impact on, on shaping. It's like kind of the, you know, the penumbra or the, or the external uh, ether around international law. Um, as a re it will make its way, accountability as a result of popular sovereignty will first make its way into international law, legal frameworks as natural law or general principles because this is the way that um, pre or extra positive legal law recognizes social movements. Um, and then I wanted to mention here the, on the, the remand litigation in Italy after the jurisdictional immunities of the state, the Italian government uh, invalidated the imp implementing legislation, um, uh, rebuking the uh, ICJ, reminding it that national courts are the makers of custom, and it used natural law principles to refuse to implement the, the courts, uh, the ICJ's decision. It's a little complicated to detail because I'm running out of time, but there's a there's a doctrine called counter limits, which was originally uh, used to as a, a kind of shield against European Union law that says that uh, you can't incorporate into the Italian legal system uh, principles of international law that are in conflict with fundamental principles of the constitutional order or of inalienable human rights. And, um, and so it, 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 it said legally it could not implement that decision. Um, to, to Mr. Roth, I would say, the choices are not limited to, to a state being governed by its own thugs on the one hand or by a foreign power, however benevolent on the other. There are ways that, can, that foreign intervention can be shaped and limited by international law. It could be limited to nonviolent aid to nonviolent movements. It could be limited to protective military means, such as no-fly zone, to protect nonviolent movements when they have been subject to force. Um, it can intervene without having regime change as its uh, uh, as its stated goal, which is how the you know the Libya intervention uh, started to go awry, um, and we can still have effective control as a as a doctrine, but in situ situations of flux, international law can try to develop uh, principles that uh, give nonviolent resistance a privileged legal status, uh, perhaps a, a privilege of nonviolence that, that, that gives them rights or greater claims to recognition than, uh, other, uh, than other violent groups, or, or uh, whether do democratic or not. And then just one last point about the Italian judgment. Um, I think that over time, if this, if this um, dissemination of citizens' power through nonviolent resistance continues to multiply, that we will see the international legal system start to move away from legal pluralism and towards um, more of a recognition of, um, of you know, a right to, to democracy or, or de democratic uh, frameworks as a condition. Um, and the, the Italian court said that it found the right to a judge and to effective judicial protection of inviolable rights is one of the greatest principles of legal culture in democratic systems of our time. When there's an echo in that line of the ICJ statute, um, Article 38, the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations, but they change it slightly to uh, make it specifically uh, democratic systems, which I think is not an accident. Thank you. So thank you all for being here. I'm glad to see colleagues I know and students. And uh, thanks to the journal for organizing the symposium. Um, and most of all, thanks to Professor Wilson for writing a very interesting paper and 
I think as she said, she's, she's onto something. She has a sort of uh, an intimation of the, the underexplored role of nonviolent resistance, civil resistance movements in uh, potentially reshaping some existing international law doctrines. And I think that's actually a very interesting idea to explore. And I can't um, do it justice uh, because it raises so many different issues. But I thought I would raise two um, observations, one about the responsibility to protect doctrine, and the second about the relationship between courts and nonviolent civil resistance movements. And have, at the end of that second point, a couple of questions for Professor Wilson and all of you to potentially to consider. I want to start with um, the comments about the responsibility to protect doctrine. So what Professor Wilson said is entirely correct, that traditionally international law makes this distinction between internal democratic legitimacy, which it doesn't really touch, and uh, international sovereignty. So the classical view is that these are not linked together, uh, and countries that are, you know, are repressive uh, are just as entitled to sit uh, on uh, internet, the body, the membership, have membership in international organizations as liberal democracies. Uh, and the canonical rules in the Montevideo Convention about uh, permanent population, defined territory, uh, uh, a government, and a capacity for international relations, together with this idea of effective control with respect to recognition of governments, really takes those democratic legitimacy ideas and the internal sovereignty idea off of the table. Now, I will say there, there have been some attempts to try to link these two together. So there are a variety of initiatives, the European Union's being the most uh, well known, to uh, link standards for recognition, whether of states or governments, to some kind of uh, substantive standard. So protection for human rights and or certain rights or power sharing among minority groups in a particular country. Uh, so there's an attempt by some countries to, to do that. And indeed, some of the minority view doctrines of recognition of governments also kind of try to bring in bring those two together. So I mean, there is this kind of dissident strand in uh, international law. I don't think it's dominant. I think Professor Wilson accurately describes things as they are. It might be worth, though, I guess a suggestion here would be exploring that dissident strand. And is there anything there about nonviolent movements that we don't haven't really explored? Because I don't think we've actually given that dissident, those, those minority positions as much uh, attention as perhaps they deserve. So there might be something useful for you there. Um, as to the ARP2P doctrine, um, I think I come out in the same place as Professor Wilson, although perhaps for different reasons, with respect to what sort of bridge between these two concepts of sovereignty the R2P doctrine can be. Uh, and I think in the end, we both sort of see this as a bridge that uh, is kind of rickety and in danger of uh, falling down. Uh, and so it's not clear that it really will sustain the burden of connecting these internal and external sovereignties as she, as she frames them. And I think the reasons why I agree with her on that are a little bit different. They're both conceptual and, and practical. So conceptually, it's certainly true that the R2P shifts the idea of sovereignty from a right to a privilege and an, an obligation. Um, and it, but it does that to overcome a particular roadblock with respect to a narrow category of very egregious situations. So gross and systematic human rights violations, mass atrocities, and so forth. Now, since the R2P doctrine has been articulated, there's been a tendency of commentators around the world to essentially say, aha, well, with that conceptual shift, we can impose a whole variety of obligations potentially on the state in order to, um, uh, to get the benefits of sovereignty externally, they need to take certain measures internally, or we will take steps to assist their citizens in their stead. So uh, conditioning thing, uh, so issues such as democratic legitimacy or a failure to respond to massive environmental harms or, or refugee flows, or as Professor Wilson suggests um, at one point in her paper, uh, perhaps some sort of response uh, that would be, give nonviolent aid to nonviolent uh, 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 civil resistance movements. The, the idea gets broadened very quickly from 2001 or so when it first gets raised, and then 2005 when it begins to show up in international documents until today. And that's not surprising. 
But, um, and this I think leads to my practical concerns, I'm not sure that R2P can bear this additional weight. Uh, and that's because what made, I think, the doctrine so important and so noteworthy, although I would still say it really is within the realm of non-binding norms or soft law, is that states and IOs endorsed it, uh, both in the UN General Assembly and in UN Security Council resolutions. So there was a, an acceptance of this paradigm shift with respect, however, to these narrow category of egregious situations. But I have to say that since that time, there has been an erosion of that state support for the norm. And, and that's across the board, not only because China and Russia won't uh, allow some form of humanitarian intervention or response in Syria uh, or elsewhere, but also among smaller and developing countries uh, that fear that uh, powerful nations will invoke a more expansive view of R2P as a pretext maybe for regime change or economic exploitation of economic resources or indeed potentially uh, even for territorial acquisitions as in the case of, of Crimea. So I, in the end, I come out to the same place as Professor Wilson. I don't think R2P can do the work she wants it to do with respect to nonviolent civil resistance movements. Uh, and so I think she has to correctly look elsewhere for where that she can find a kind of, you know, an analytical hook to talk about these things. Um, Moving to the second part of my comments, which goes directly to nonviolent civil resistance as a tool for promoting popular sovereignty, um, it, Professor Wilson's kind of looking around for different places this might fit. Maybe it would fit as a criteria for recognition of states maybe and governments. Maybe it would fit somehow as a principle of, of assistance to nonviolent civil resistance movements uh, by governments in one state to movements in another state. Um, but I want to specifically home in on this 2014 Italian Constitutional Court decision, uh, which she's described, which essentially says, you know, to the ICJ, get stuffed, right? We're sticking to our guns, and we know there are a normative doc there are legal doctrines within our own national legal order, our own fundamental constitutional principles, our own conception of, of human rights, which allow us to essentially push back against this decision in Germany versus Italy in 2012. And I thought I, that's obviously quite uh, interesting, but I wondered then how that intersects with this idea of nonviolent civil resistance. So in looking at the uh, Stephen and, uh, or Stephen and Chenoweth definition of nonviolent civil resistance, which you had up on the uh, slides a few minutes ago, I, it was, I was struck the extent to which these were uh, expressly and also implicitly not just outside of political channels, but outside of legal channels too, right? So it's, they define it as outside of lobbying and, and, and advocacy in the legislative realm, but they never mention courts at all. Now, we know from another whole set of um, literature and law and, and um, social movements and so forth that uh, civil society groups use impact litigation, bring uh, litigation both at the domestic, the regional, and the international level as a tool for fomenting social and, and legal change. And I think that can sometimes be a very powerful tool, but I wonder to what extent it can backfire. And that goes to the point in which when you concluded, and this I'm coming to the very end of my comments, you mentioned, well, if the Italian constitutional court's approach is more widely followed, we might see uh, a space opening up for nonviolent civil resistance. And I guess I would just caution to, in saying that to wonder whether the Italian court ought not be seen as an outlier and an outlier that might actually provoke a kind of backlash that would go against what you wanted, which might say that courts ought to stay out of this business of uh, either promoting or inhibiting nonviolent uh, civil resistance. And that's because if you know the history of these cases, one of the reasons why Germany went to the ICJ in the, in the first place was because the, um, uh, the Italian Court of Cassation in an earlier ruling had essentially rejected Germany's immunity uh, uh, sovereignty arguments. And uh, that ruling was not followed by most, although not all, most other courts around the world. Uh, and after the ICJ ruling, the Italian uh, Constitutional Court, a different court, but nevertheless in the same country, essentially kind of uh, doubling down on this idea that we'll define our own norms, thank you very much. So we don't know yet what the reaction to that decision would be. And maybe some of the, com the speakers here will know if there have been citations to that, whether positive or negative. But if we see a counter reaction to that, then I wonder whether 
reports will end up as, as one of the, the tools in the overall toolkit for nonviolent civil resistance movements, or are they something that in fact is going to be problematic? So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you. We now have time for questions or Um, can you hear me if I say that? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I think you're, I absolutely agree with you about uh, R2P. Um, about the, the courts and the relation to nonviolent civil resistance, I also think that's correct. I had sort of two papers that I was writing, one on the Italian decision and one on the nonviolent civil resistance, and I tried to kind of get them, get them together. Um, but not, not necessarily sutured very tightly. Um, I, I think that um, you're right in that definition, there is nothing legal. I think that the, the, the group of, of, of thinkers and scholars and activists that work on this issue would like there to be a greater uh, you know, a nexus to law and to, to try to find a way to root this in, in, in law in some ways, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that courts should be the, uh, you know, the, uh, in the forefront mm -hmm. of this. I was kind of trying to suggest that you know, it really needs to be a kind of bottom-up movement, and, and you know, to the extent that it's a bottom-up movement, then it's, it's on sure ground. I mean, it, it's worked in Latin America fairly uh, smoothly, but it was very much a bottom-up uh, you know, movement there, and um, you know, courts can't get out too far in front of where of where things stand uh, politically. But I do think that there's something shifting in the the the, you know, the geopolitical order, and that that law should have some you know should be aware of this. At, at, in any, oh, oh, sh oh. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, should be aware of this and, and be thinking about you know how this might fit in or affect or change. The Yeah, who's moderating? Right. <laughs> That's fine. I'm happy to do it. Uh, John, do you want to go first? Uh, in regards to your notion of, of popular sovereignty, how does this play out when you have different, for instance, ethnic or religious groups within a country who are all conducting nonviolent protests against each other? Um, <laughs> I mean, I was just thinking in, in Myanmar, which I guess a lot of those are not, I mean, those are very violent in, in some instances, but if you think of the Rohingya, who among ethnic minorities are the outcasts, even among ethnic minorities, um, what does that look? What does that notion of sovereignty look like when the the people aren't even equal, even among themselves, regardless of a, a repressive government? Well, my, um, you know, I'm I'm constantly cautioned to giving too much of a moral, um, you know, moral cast to nonviolent resistance movements because they're not always done because people really, truly, in their hearts feel nonviolently. Um, but I think, kind of, in, in terms of um, the objective impacts that that they have, there's a greater chance for when for resolution when you know you have you have conflict that stops short of violence and particularly murderous violence. So so the the Myanmar case is not a great example of uh, for that you know for that. Not groups non I'm not aware of a situation where where groups, you know, mutually repressed groups are, are nonviolently protesting against one another. If if, if you know of one, I'm I'm happy to to hear of it. I think that uh, just what I would say is that um, you know I understand the the preference of international, the, the inertia factor in international law, that there's a, the international law wants to keep a certain sense of order. They don't want, you know, smaller groups spinning off into smaller and smaller states and, and, and creating a kind of chaos. So I, I, I totally uh, am sympathetic with that. And I think that, you know, Cassese's notion of internal uh, self-determination versus external self-determination is, is helpful here, that if a group can get you know, kind of control of its own destiny within the context of a larger state that it can live with, that that's an arrangement that can, that can work um, long term. And, and I, I think that's what I, I um, uh, you know, might be a solution in <coughs> the kind of thing you're talking about. 
Professor Michael. Yes, I think I have a question that is very close to John's question, but mine hasn't been answered, so maybe it's different. Okay. One reason we distinguish the external and internal um, aspects of sovereignty is that externally we want to treat states as Equal. unities, mm -hmm. and internally we allow for plurality and we allow for processes within which these pluralities lead to ideally majority governments and minority protections in some ways. Right? The problem with popular sovereignty has always been, it seems to be, to deny that kind of plurality. That is to say, the people somehow have a will, and that will should count instead of the will of the government. Now the problem is, the people is always a fiction in that, in that regard. The people consists of various groups, and although those groups always claim to speak for the entire people, uh, quite frequently um, they do not. Right? So one problem in your conception of trying to link the external and the internal in effect of sovereignty is how to account for, how to count not how nonviolent are they, but how much can they claim actually to speak for the people, be popularly sovereign, as opposed to just being a group that wants to find power through other means than through whatever means the respective country allows for. Um, and second, also coming back to the questions here of um, sovereign immunity and um, especially use Kojin's uh, human rights um, violations, but also R2P. The goal often is not to protect majorities, right? Because majorities typically do fairly well in their home countries. The goal often is to protect um, minorities or even individuals, what we do through human rights law, right? Mm -hmm. And does your concept fit into that particular, particularly well? Or does it not rather lead to more protection for uh, majorities and not um, minorities? Okay. Um, just on the popular, on the popular will question, this is the, the, the kind of uh, objection raised by Roth in his article, and that I take quite that I take quite seriously. Um, I would say that um, pop, yeah, the popular will or asserting the popular will is a fiction. The state is also a fiction. Um, that there's a you know. Part of how international law gets written is that you know, there are certain concepts that appear in, in political reality and then they're, they're, you know, they're, they're ratified and, and reified in, through discourses that create a framework around them that makes that, that thing make sense. Um, so I, I, I am specifically thinking of situations, I mean, the, the prime example would be a situation where a state is ground to a halt by a, a civil resistance movement when the when the consent is withdrawn at a particular moment in time. And now, whether that is um, you know what you want to do with the with the idea that there is a, a popular uh, a popular sovereignty, like what that means in international law, I'm I'm not sure I've fully decided, um, but I think that that. It is, um, you know, it's a problem that it doesn't have any kind of a place in international law because it has a place in domestic law, and it's also there, kind of a fictional entity as well. But we find ways to live with it and work with it in domestic law. So, you know, could there be something? You know, is there a, a, a way to make a space for this in international law? Um, Can I interject something just really quickly? Okay. Uh, the state is a certain construct. And the popular will is not on the same level as a, as a, as a construct, right? I mean, we, we speak of popular will at some points, but it doesn't have the same kind of, in your words, reification as does the state traditionally. Are you saying that descriptive? Um, well, you seem to say they're all fictions, and so we can just treat them the same way. Well, and I just I wonder that different types of fiction. We Sorry, I interrupted. I <laughs> well, we, we, we. The state has a sort of physical existence, but we also kind of give it, we personify it in, in, in anthropo, anthropo, anthropologic, anthropomorphize. anthropomorphize it, thank yeah. you. Um, and we, we give it self-interest, and we give it a will to survive, and we, you know, we, we give attributes to it which are, um, you know, kind of 
fictional in, in some sense. I mean, there maybe the the popular will is harder to determine, but I don't know that it's it's completely conceptually different. Um, but let me think about that. Um, about the majoritarianism, uh, that's that's a that's a legitimate point in another context. And I didn't have even time to get to even thinking about that here. I would say that you know we want to have certain kinds of um, criteria. You can never you're you're never going to be able to escape natural law or general principles in trying to work out these these kinds of issues. So yes, it's it's true that there can be a majoritarianism that overrides minority rights. There can be there could be nonviolent civil resistance in the service of uh, heinous. Um, you know, some sort of heinous goals, but they would have to stop short of physical, you know, violations of integrity because that would violate the principle of nonviolence. So built into it, I think, is a certain, you know, a certain limitations that, you know, physical integrity <coughs> crimes will not be carried out by groups that are practicing nonviolent civil resistance. Um, but you could also, you know, you could also build into a framework saying, okay, they have to be, um, you know, they have to ha espouse certain kind of fundamental principles. Uh, you know, they have to be non-discriminatory, or they have to be at least nominally, nominally uh, universalist. They can't like exclude um, certain groups in principle from the scope of their um, of their action, and and you could. You know, refine the criteria that you use to, to uh, you know, support one group or another. So unfortunately, we are out of time. So please join me in thanking Professor Wilson, and we'll move on to our next uh, panel.